I think that talking about love for me gives us clarity. Love and abuse or love and racism or love and discrimination fundamentally cannot coexist. I think it's a rallying call that is really an important aspiration for us. Hello, and welcome to Shared Space, a podcast about the power of architecture and design to make us healthier, happier, and more connected. I'm your host, Erin Peavy, and I'm so glad that you're here with us. Today, I'm speaking with nationally recognized design leader, researcher, writer, and educator, Katie Swenson. Katie is senior principal of Mass Design Group, an international nonprofit architecture firm whose mission is to research, build, and advocate for architecture that promotes justice and human dignity. You can see why I wanted so much to have her on today. Before joining Mass during early 2020, she was vice president of design and sustainability at Enterprise Community Partners, a national nonprofit organization that invests more than eight billion annually in community development. And that's a big part of what we'll be talking about and unpacking today. Katie has countless accolades, including being a Harvard Globe Fellow and a prolific author, an awesome mom to three very cool spirited girls. And today we are going to be deep diving into her recent book, Design with Love at Home in America which captures the lessons of 20 years of community-based development in creating beautiful, well-designed, affordable housing for America's most vulnerable communities, from the streets of Skid Row to West Baltimore. And my version of this book is earmarked, highlighted, and filled with inspiring stories that make it tangible how design can be a force for positive change. Katie, welcome to Shared Space. It's so great to be here with you, Erin. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. So I thought we'd just dive in, and I'd love to hear your earliest memories of when you realized that the built environment sort of existed and how it can impact people. Oh, Erin, it's um, an interesting question to just reflect back on the power of space, as you said in your intro, and to remember those kind of both early and still to this day kind of memories. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Bethesda, Maryland, about two miles from the border of Washington, DC. My mom was an art historian and a tour guide at the Smithsonian. And I have this kind of distinct memory of the monumentality of DC. My parents were actually engaged on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. (laughs) And that kind of understanding about Um, aspiring civic architecture, and in many ways in contrast to sort of the residential quality of the suburban neighborhoods in which we live made a big impact on me. My family moved to Boston when I was 10, and Boston is, of course, a very different kind of city, a very granular city. I lived, again, in the suburbs, but went to school in Fenway and used to row on the Charles River, I think seeing the city from the water, especially in the afternoons at early Boston, 4 p.m. sunset, (laughs) views of Cambridge and Boston and the lights sort of twinkling, was one of those most kind of sublime experiences. But also, you know, at that time in high school, I'd started to volunteer at Rosie's Place, a shelter for homeless women in the South End neighborhood of Boston. I think so much now about the kind of terms we use Um, in the community development field. We talk about housing security and housing insecurity. It sounds a little bit clinical, but that reality of the difference between the two, I think, could not be more profound. Without a home, everything else falls apart. And I think for me, the disparity between my conception of home, the home that I had the privilege and to this day have the privilege of experiencing. And the reality of homelessness or housing insecurity was really jarring. And I think it was somewhere in that kind of dislocation that my core commitments were really born. Such an inspiring story. Um, And I think it's just, yeah, at the core of, it's very clear that lays the groundwork for everything that you've done since. So can you talk with us about that? Talk with us about your current role at Mass and your personal path to becoming 
an architect, writer, and community development expert. Sure. Um, it was a bit of a meandering path, I would say. I have um, children who are in their early 20s and try to remind them that, you know, in some ways my career, which has been so incredibly robust, got kind of a late start. After high school, I went to from Boston out to UC Berkeley. I majored in comparative literature. So perhaps seeding my love of reading and writing. Mm -hmm. I got to spend a year in Paris where um, I also got to kind of walk the city and um, soak in uh, that urban form. Also at Berkeley, I started to dance. And um, upon graduation, I moved to New York. Mm -hmm. And for the next six years in my early 20s, I danced um, as a modern dancer wow. in a variety of um, self-made and other yeah. venues. And then was just kind of an active, I would say, citizen of the city and got engaged in sort of larger design, larger and smaller design projects in the city. Mm -hmm. So off I went to architecture school at the University of Virginia. And that was a major kind of turning point for me, of course, to be able to kind of harness this other uh, passion of mine. After UVA, I became a member of the second class of the Enterprise Rose Fellowship Program. Mm -hmm. And that was obviously a fundamental uh, moment in my career. We'll talk about the Rose Fellowship, but essentially it's an effort to partner designers um, with community-based development corporations. So I got to participate in, I think, a generational movement around public interest design and design centers at the time. Started a design center in Charlottesville upon finishing the Rose Fellowship, and then came back to Enterprise to lead the fellowship. And, you know, that story is really told in Design with Love, um, yeah. my work there was to, at the beginning, make the case why design matters. Um, mm -hmm. Why is design important in affordable housing and community development? Yes. And to sort of fuel the field with the thought leadership and tools mm -hmm. to integrate design into community development. And not, but, you know, least but not, um, last but not least, to flood the field with designers, both Rose Fellows and others, yeah. brought really an attitude and a set of capabilities about how to design in partnership with communities. Yeah. So back in 2010, as um, leader of the Rose Fellowship, I was with a group of the fellows at Structures for Inclusion, a conference that used to be held annually to bring together public interest designers. Um, it was at Howard University. Mm -hmm. And I there met Michael Murphy as the Butaro Hospital was under construction. And I felt like I was seeing sort of the future of the public interest design movement kind of take this major step forward where um, Mass was taking on projects of uh, both uh, larger ambition theoretically and at scale. The core hypothesis at the time was the idea that buildings are never neutral. Yes. They either hurt or they heal. And I think what's been so exciting is to see Mass really live into that question and come to this place of proof where yeah. we understand the implications of that. So I joined the team in February of 2020. Right, the time to join. Um, it's been kind of a dream for me to come on full time at Mass. Yeah. And it was, of course, in the moment of um, COVID hitting, mm -hmm. which, you know, in many ways, I think has kind of solidified that core commitment. You know, yeah. our buildings matter, they do affect our health or in our yeah. well being. Um, so, as a senior principal, I'm in charge of leading the advancement and narrative team, mm -hmm. um, designing kind of the practice of mass, I would say, and our ability to pursue seminal work and develop our narrative is key. 
I also work within our affordable housing practice. Mm -hmm. And then I think my love of mentorship and education also um, gets me involved in helping to try to create a kind of learning organization at Mass. Yeah. That's awesome. Wonderful. Um, So jumping into talking about your book, Design with Love, I just loved hearing your process of discovery and then getting to hear about other people's processes of discovery. You say, I naively thought that design could be the answer. It was my mistake to think that design itself could solve a problem without recognizing that it takes people joining together, using many tools, including design, to support their community. I realized that this job didn't require me to be an expert. It required me to be a humble facilitator. Can you unpack this for us? I think there's been a lot of questioning, certainly over my tenure in the field, the last 20 years, about the role of architecture and architects within the profession. There's been a critique of architects as service providers, meaning Mm -hmm. that architects essentially serve those who call, pick up the phone. Mm -hmm respond Mm -hmm. to a request, um, respond to paying clients. And, you know, Mass, both Mass Design and the Rose Fellowship are organized to serve those who may not be able to pay, who may not readily assume that designers are what they need. But I think within that larger framework, it's really important to remember that designers are always working in service to our partners and also working in service to the broader societal goals that a project or partner presents. Can I ask you a question about that? I know that many people in mass work in healthcare and I'm sure you're you know probably familiar with the Hippocratic Oath. You know, we're talking about do no harm. And we understand that design is never neutral. I think a lot of times we're taking on projects that are saying do X, Y, or Z. But my question is like, you know, what is, what is our commitment to thinking about that broader community and thinking about, you know, their intrinsic needs um, and their needs to be heard? In architecture, um, you know, we prioritize the, sort of core safety of a building, the kind of the structural uh, physical safety. Although one could argue in the age of coronavirus that the safety of that building has not heretofore been made to include the quality of the air and the protection of safe breathing air for residents. So we've even in some ways fall, fall, fallen short of the physical safety of the building. But how can, we, um, how can we really understand who we are as architects if we're not necessarily creating the, um, the aspiration and a sort of metric, I think, to evaluate the dignity of the spaces that we're creating as a core competency, really, of a building. Yeah. Yeah, I think that aspect about dignity is so critical, and I'm so happy to, you know, hear you talking about that. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what has shaped your understanding of architecture and design's role in dismantling systemic injustice rather than contributing to its perpetuation? I, you know, that was a quote that came right out of your book. And I just thought, yeah, we we need to be exploring that. Yeah. Well, I'll say first that it's really been a learning journey for me. In 2001, when I entered into the community development field for the first time as a Rose Fellow, I knew that I wanted to be a part of helping people in poor neighborhoods But I did not understand why things were the way they were. And further, I would say there was a lot of misinformation out there. Mm -hmm. That was kind of an era of an attitude around um, what was called broken window syndrome. But it's been a learning journey for all of us. And um, I was so lucky to be able to 
worked closely with April de Simone from Designing the We and was able to co teach a seminar with her called Undesign the Red Line. Okay, so for anyone that's not familiar with Red Line, just like the quick, tiny preview of what you mean. I mean, I think you just kind of summarized it with discriminatory practices, but. Absolutely. Um, the, our federal, state, local governments and banks have, have participated in racially discriminatory housing policies yeah. um, that included where um, redlining was a system to evaluate neighborhoods by the characteristics of their inhabitant. Mm -hmm. And essentially areas were designated blue, green, yellow, and red and people who lived in uh, neighborhoods that were deemed blue or green were able to have access to credit and mortgages. The trick is that those neighborhoods were white and had racial covenants on them that prevented people of color from moving into those neighborhoods. And so they were deemed safe for investment. Yellow neighborhoods, they called um, in transition. And red neighborhoods um, were not safe for investment based on the fact that people of either, the, as they called, the Negro race or immigrants or um, Europe, you know, European immigrants, including Germans and Poles and Irish and others, Italians, um, who lived in a neighborhood they called detrimental influences and said that those neighborhoods were not safe for investment. So, you know, to dig into that question deeper, I mean, I think, you know, kind of a, an uncomfortable question that I'd love to ask is just around what do you see as the role of white designers in serving community of, communities of color? Yeah, well, I, you know, I won't pretend to have, you know, a pat answer on this. Again, I think yeah. it's, a time when we're all learning. I was just reading The Fire This Time by Jasmine Ward. And, you know, in her introduction, she, she writes at one point, race in the U.S. is not a tidy matter. And mm -hmm. she brings up a couple of points. Um, the first is understanding how heavily the past bears on our present and on our future. So mm -hmm. I think the first thing that white designers and all designers need to really do is to really understand history in a much more um, precise way. The other thing that she brings up, sort of the exhaustion of the moment for people of color, um, yes. kind of recognizing how the kind of exuberance of this moment around <laughs> dialogue is also triggering of deep trauma. And so how do we as, as um, allies and accomplices understand what is the work that we have to do, you know, working hard to listen and be present and be accountable personally. So, you know, when you look broader and I'm, and sort of understand what cities and communities are doing, what do you see that designers and city policymakers are both getting wrong and getting right? Well, I think, um, I don't know, I think it's a, you know, it's sort of a, an interesting moment in the history of our country. One of the things that I would say that is righter than we realize, let me put it that mm -hmm. way, writing <laughs> design with love um, you know, it was a long journey, of course, but one of the sort of seminal moments was meeting with the Rose Fellows in 2016, October of 2016 in San Francisco. I had been in New York and came out sort of late to this group and um, participated in this conversation that happened on the last day of the retreat. And so I would just preface it as a moment of vulnerability and sort of fatigue. But there mm -hmm. became this conversation around um, this kind of divide between urban and rural. Hmm. And um, in many ways, the fellows who were working in rural communities saying, you know, out loud, like, you all have no idea what rural America is really like. 
you know, this idea of red state, blue state, of the coast, of the cities, of the country. The rural community fellows were essentially saying, you know, don't stereotype us. Don't think that you know what is happening in these communities. We're not all white. We're not all conservative, not all Republican. In fact, there's a whole set of issues that are going on. So I think we're getting wrong a lot of the kind of stereotypes that we've seen are really starting to kind of break down our trust and and aspiration for each other. I hope Mm -hmm. that Design with Love starts to take you on kind of a tour of just a fraction of the kind of America that I've gotten to see visiting probably 90 communities across the country, where invariably there are a lot of things that are going right to in Mm -hmm. these conditions of severe uh, discriminatory practices and severe racism and other pieces that are really holding communities back and keeping communities in poverty. There's also a tremendous amount of local community organizing and community ambition of local people who are really fighting for the best for their neighbors and it's inspiring to see. So I think there's um, there's a lot of good news out there that doesn't yeah. get on to the primetime news. Yeah, I think that was one of the, you know, just beautiful things about your book was the overwhelming power that love can have. And that, you know, the combination of your writing and your colleagues' photos just really brought to life. You know, I was struck by how many, you know, how much of the narrative was really you quoting all of the people in the communities that you served. And I just thought that that and and that the Rose Fellows touched. And I just thought that was so appropriate and so perfect because it gave you, gave the reader this feeling of, okay, like I'm actually hearing their voice and getting to hear their stories. And it and it is that like within all of us at our deepest core is is love and is goodness and is, you know, the want to lift one another up and to be a part of a community and a place of belonging. I think that, you know, the stories that you share really pull out that aspect and pull it down to its core goodness. Mm, Well, thank you so much. I mean, that's obviously just music to my ears. The first thing (laughs) You know, I'll say is working with Harry Connolly, who had been photographing the Rose Fellows since 2005. I met him first when he came to photograph me as a part of my fellowship in Charlottesville and then has gotten to know each fellow and brings this kind of humanity. You asked earlier my role as a as a white designer and in this case as a white author. Um, Mm -hmm. I felt like. I have had this incredible privilege of being able to get to know uh, Rose Fellows and their community partners on the ground. They are the experts in their own stories. There's beyond a shadow of a doubt. But one of the things that I had had exposure to was sort of all of them in a way. And I, you know, have gotten to know sort of the connective tissues that we in between them. So what I, you know, felt like this wonderful opportunity to be able to write about this from a perspective, from seeing a number of communities, but worked hard to make sure that it was the voices and stories of the people on the ground who were telling their own stories and and participated in the editing of the stories and <laughs> reviewing and feedback and you know a couple of the drafts we had to kind of retool at the behest of um, of the the core protagonists in it as as you would expect because you know they are the the authors of their story. Yeah. So in your book, you quote Dr. Cornell West and. He says, never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. Do you see the role of love? How how do you see the role of love in design? And why do you think it's so important? Yeah. You know, I I was just rereading Bell Hooks's book, I think from Mm -hmm. maybe 20 years ago, 
um, called All About Love. And mm -hmm. um, in the first chapter, she she says, like, let's go ahead and define love. You know, <laughs> I think she, you know, she also makes this point that so many of us are sort of taught to believe that the mind and not the heart, she says, is the seat of learning. And we think that to speak of love with any kind of emotional intensity will mean it will be perceived as weak or irrational. Bell Hooks defines love um, as the will to nurture our own and another's spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. And with that, she makes the point that therefore love and abuse cannot coexist. Yeah. So when Martin Luther King talks about the beloved community, mm -hmm. you know, he's building on, of course, a larger tradition around um, love and the beloved community, but he didn't see it necessarily as kind of this utopian idea that, you know, was an idea of heaven. He thought it was actually something that was real, that could be achieved in um, our human world, in the beloved community, poverty, hunger, and homelessness will not be tolerated because international standards of human decency will not allow it. If Bell Hook says yeah. love and abuse cannot ex coexist, then Martin Luther King is saying, Martin Luther King Jr. is saying racism and all yeah. forms of discrimination, yeah. you know, cannot exist in the beloved community. Yeah. So I think that talking about love for me mm -hmm. gives us clarity. Love and abuse or love and racism or love and discrimination fundamentally cannot coexist. I think it's a rallying call that is really an important aspiration for us. I couldn't agree more with, you know, the, the sentiments um, that you shared of Bell Hooks in that um, love and, and, you know, I would venture to say many you know, oftentimes thought of as feminine, quote unquote, feminine qualities are those that are, yeah, that's irrational and emotional. And by that, we mean it's less valuable and it's less, um, it's less worthy of consideration. And I think now is the time, if it hadn't already been the time to really question that is, you know, is utter logic and is an absence of emotion um, really our, our core goal? Yeah, well, the mechanisms of what, you know, what, make, what makes life, you know, worth living, right? And it, maybe it's yeah. Maslow's kind of hierarchy of needs. Um, but, you know, ultimately, of course, we need ideas of, of shelter, for example. Yeah. But you know, we as importantly need ideas of identity. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, issues around about how our built environment can contribute to our sense of, you know, certainly it has to contribute to our physical safety and um, our physical needs. But until it contributes to kind of the amplification of our, uh, whether it's our, our spiritual needs. Now, the book does not necessarily, it's, it's not, it's sort of agnostic about, well, it's not, I don't know if it's agnostic. It, it presents communities, some of whom are quite clear about the spiritual underpinnings, but they're all mm -hmm. a little bit different, right? They're coming from different mm -hmm. kind of faith traditions and it doesn't have to be a faith tradition but sort of the underpinnings of our aspirations our aspirational selves our sense yeah. of how we see the world you see yeah. throughout the book these kind of core commitments to our interdependence and you know an understanding of the world which means that we're we're connected that is sort of fundamentally to creating our sense of self too and our and our place within it which allows us in turn of course to be aspirational ourselves in our lives and yeah. what propels us as a culture yeah. 
So, you know, to take that into its physical manifestation, I really loved the example that you share of Franklin Square. Mm. Um, And I was just wondering if you could sort of tell us about this project and, you know, what made it special? Mm, Absolutely. Um, So many things. Um, (laughs) You know, first of all, I would say um, it's important to know that the the photographer Harry Connolly is from Baltimore. So Mm. he has been a partner in the Kirby Lane Park project. And so you'll see so many of the kind of photos and kind of uh, a bit more of the daily interaction um, in that chapter. And also that was one of the chapters that, you know, I rewrote really with um, the leadership of Donald Quarles, who, mm-hmm. you know, is the community leader and, and sort of hero of, of this story, although there are, of course, so many stories. So, you know, I would say, first of all, um, Donald is, you know, quite clear that when we talk about cities, the first thing to talk about is not their negative attributes, you know, mm-hmm. but to understand sort of the power of places and, you know, he sort of starts out by, you know, we start the chapter by saying that there are good things happening in Baltimore. And yeah. he's really intent on kind of drawing energy to the positive momentum. Now, we also all know that there are some very bad things that are going on in Baltimore and that the systemic underpinnings um, have everything to do with that. So if we talked about redlining that happened in many communities in the 1930s, Baltimore got a head start with race-based zoning practices as far as back as 1910. And so that has perpetuated into the kind of fabric of the city, which have created neighborhoods that um, don't have the kind of amenities and and neighborhood, well, I won't say neighborhood fabric, they absolutely have neighborhood fabric. Yeah. But they don't have some of the core elements of, of safety. Especially the built, I mean, even just you know, the, the aspects that allow it to be maintained, it, you know, it talks about all of the city sort of utilities that it feels like it, it's like this beautiful thing that's just been abandoned. And it's like, they haven't abandoned one another, but it's been slowly pulled out from underneath them, making it more and more difficult to, to maintain that fabric that you're talking about, which is clearly incredibly rich uh, especially you know say 20 30 years ago the the story in baltimore is so much about um the franklin square neighborhood association kind of uh, organizing and pulling together and and donald's um incredible leadership but it's also this kind of other story about um donald and rose fellow daniel greenspan who of any fellow maybe most represents a kind of humility and listening. He's an incredibly empathic person. And he and um, Donald became this kind of uh, just sort of unbeatable partnership. And I think as Donald began to appreciate what Daniel was able to bring, it helped him raise his aspirations. So mm-hmm. beginning, the idea was, okay, there are a bunch of these empty lots, which where there used to be homes, and those yeah. homes have been left to abandonment and then torn down. The yeah. sites get left with some rubble on the site, and then were used as kind of dumping grounds because that was sort of allowed. And so the first you know, energy behind what became the Kirby Lane Park was to stop the dumping. And um, when Daniel and Donald first met through the Celebration Church and community in the neighborhood, I think Daniel was sort of like, well, let's build a fence. So, you know, as <laughs> always, the project got started to, like, build a fence to stop the dumping. Yeah. Well, like, good things, is, as, as Donald so accurately points out, good things lead to the next good thing. And he started mm-hmm. to... Like, he's like, oh, he has an architect and a builder on his team. What does that mean for a community member to have an architect and builder and partner, you know, by by one side? And their aspirations started to grow. So then it was like, well, we need to start making, we started talking about this kind of idea of a park and a safe space in the neighborhood. And 
you know, to make it safe for children, you need to have adults out there. So what do the adults like to do? Well, they like to play horseshoes in this neighborhood. So the next project was a horseshoe pit. And so, and so, and so it goes. And so it's a beautiful story, I think, of this kind of incredible leadership from the community and also this very, like, humble, incredibly sort of helpful role of a designer who's also able to not only help draw and envision and test and iterate and, you know, be a kind of, um, be a sort of uh, vision lens, but also help navigate some of the city systems and bolster um, the ability of the community group to do that. It was always the community group leading, um, but it's been an incredible project to watch and, you know, really kind of continues to this day, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I was curious to hear, you know, if you've talked to them and how they're faring today and navigating this, you know, pandemic and how the park, you know, potentially has been serving them. Yeah, well, you know, I think uh, the pandemic has made a few things really clear. <laughs> now, one of them is like, first of all, like home is like the thing that matters. Like, mm-hmm. if, we, if we didn't know it before, we certainly know it now, right? Home is kind of the unit of built form we need more than anything. But the second is um, garden, right? Home yeah. and garden. We need um, we need sort of the safety and shelter of our homes to not only live, but also go to school and work and exercise yeah. and, you know, do all the things we now rely on our home to provide a platform for. But we also need these outdoor spaces more than ever. And um, so Kirby Lane Park has put in place a sort of their own, you know, sort of rules and regulations around mask wearing and safety. Yeah. But, um, you know, continues to be a place that is stewarded by local residents, led by Donald. But he's yeah. not at all the only one. He's got a whole team. Um, yeah you know, for the community. Yeah. Awesome. I know that at the same time you were writing Design with Love, you were also working on In Bohemia, which is a very different type of love story. And I was wondering if you could share a tiny bit about that book and, you know, what it meant to you. Yeah, we set about um, trying to start to scope out Design with Love and um, think about you know, how to approach the book and our kind of travel schedule and ideas, Harry and I and our colleagues in Enterprise and fellows. And then in May of 2017, my partner, my fiance, um, we were to be married um, two months later, Mm -hmm. uh, died very suddenly, completely unexpectedly of a fatal heart attack. You know, it stopped the presses for me. One of the responses that I was so incredibly lucky to have found was writing. And about Mm -hmm. 10 days after his death, I started writing and um, I didn't stop. And (laughs) I, you know, I wasn't writing a book. I was just writing to save my life. It was like this just um, complete flood of knowing and and searching and writing became this real um, self for me in a way to, I think this, you know, deep investigation that was very personal into kind of the, the nature of love, how love is so... Uh, love is about that larger commitment that we talked about earlier. Yeah. That there's a transformative power of love that's unlike any other thing. You know, I don't know mm-hmm. any other either emotion or economic stimulus or building design which can have the same transformative power of love. And so, you know, I think as... Um, I came to do this kind of meditation on love and what it is. And over time, as I started to re-knit myself back together and kind of come back to work and, and understand and re-reflect on the work that I'd been involved with for so many years, I came to sort of understand the work of the Rose Fellows differently through that lens. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think the book would have been called Design with Love 
That's awesome. If you could just share what's, if there's only one takeaway, like what's the one thing that you wish people knew around designing to foster that connection and um, belonging that we would use to inform our design decisions? Both of these books are about, they're both about love and they're both about home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think those are two key critical concepts that I hope that people will take away the criticality and importance of home that, you know, provides the platform for all of us and that we need to then take that commitment through love into a kind of housing policy and an attitude that we bring into both architecture and design, but also into all of our kind of larger national you know, core, core, house, core policies. Mm-hmm. So I would say if there's, you know, one thing to sort of take away, it's an understanding that I think we're all aspiring to be able to bring kind of our most aware selves. We fall short. I fall short all the time, but that mm-hmm. our job is in a sense to try to pay attention and try to live up to sort of being a ready partner um, with others in developing these quality of relationships that will create the kind of quality of the work. Katie, I can't thank you enough for sharing your time and sharing your stories with me and with all of us. And it's just been such a joy talking with you. Thank you, Erin. You know, I think the thing that um, has characterized my new relationship with you has been your curiosity and your deep commitment to learning. So I really want to thank you for including me in your journey. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode of Shared Space. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a minute to subscribe wherever you're listening and head on over to Apple to give us a review. It really helps to spread the word and we really appreciate it. I hope that your day is filled with honest emotion, kindness, and connection. Thanks so much and take care.